Welcome to Nampo Harvest Day 2018. And this time around, welcome to the Nation in Conversation series here at Nampo, brought to you by the Land Bank. My name is Andy Lekumalo. I'm the Managing Director of Power 98.7, and I'm proud to be hosting this first of a few uh, elements of a series that is really discussing the issues that are facing the agricultural sector in South Africa. Um, a transformation, inclusive growth are very big on the agenda. But of course, a land bank being quite central on high impact financing arrangements. This uh, day is a special one because we do have a panel of experts on the land bank side, whether they are finding commercial farmers that are much bigger or emerging farmers that are coming into the industry. Um, we're going to find out how they do that, the challenges that they kind of go through, how we as those prospective entrepreneurs in the industry could learn and, uh, and have the land bank service as a lot better. And also, we also have some stories, some, a, re a real showcase of people who've received support from the land banks, various financing arrangements. We're going to hear from them in first-hand experience about how uh, they have kind of fared as a result of that support. Later on also, we've got a, an audience here in Nampo who's going to be part of the conversation as and when they become um, more and more part of the conversation. But without any further ado, we live in times where the issue of land and particularly agriculture is quite important. Now, this is something that's come up quite often since uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa took office and in his State of the Nation address, addressed the land issue and he put a caveat to it. And that caveat was about food security and it was about the means and the ability of South Africans to cultivate that land to ensure that we are secure when it comes to food as a country. And of course, that brings the whole question of how do you then make sure that one, commercial farmers remain and continue to be successful, especially on the backdrop of the droughts that we've had in recent times. But also too, when you talk about transformation and inclusive growth, how do you make sure more and more, particularly black farmers, uh, get into the industry and particularly women or, or, or female owned businesses get into the industry and also become successful. And the land bank is, is good at certain aspects in doing so. And I'm pretty sure also challenge in certain aspects. We're gonna find out about all of that as we get through this nation in conversation. Now, I'm going to kick off by going straight into uh, my first guest on my left here. Uh, this is uh, Sidney Soundy. He's the executive uh, responsible for strategy and communications at the Land Bank. And uh, I guess the, the, the second part of your job, Sydney, uh, can be quite daunting because um, we have all got our own views about what Land Bank should or should not do, what Land Bank can or cannot do. And uh, at times, I guess we, we can frustrate you guys uh, by asking for all sorts of things you can't do. And uh, where I would like to start, and maybe it's linked also to strategy, is just give us a sense about the background and the mandate of the land bank in the context of the ag agricultural sector, and maybe with specifics towards the funding and support of emerging black farmers, because I certainly hear constant criticism about the land bank not doing enough. Yeah, thanks, uh, Andy. Uh, <clears throat> so le let me perhaps uh, give a bit of context uh, with regard to the mandate of the bank as such. Uh, our mandate is uh, drawn from the Land Bank Act of uh, 2002. And uh, that act is specific in terms of the expectations of Land Bank uh, in regard to supporting the sector in general, and in particular, uh, advancing the objectives of transformation and inclusivity in the sector. So like you uh, indicated up front, uh, the bank uh, is established as a state-owned entity uh, and as a result uh, owned uh, by government. Uh, the bank uh, uh, gets its funding uh, from the commercial markets. So like other commercial banks, uh, we go and uh, raise investments into the bank so that we can on lend uh, to uh, customers in the agricultural sector. Uh, so that needs to be understood uh, that Land Bank in that context also has to deal with uh, the ability to repay those loans that it uh, uh, raises in the commercial markets. Uh, so we have, if you wish, as a structure, a uh, cost of funding that we have to account for, uh, as well as the ability to lend pretty much for transformational purposes at something that other people would call affordable financing. Mm. So the challenge for land bank is much more perhaps bigger than commercial banks would have where their objective is largely profit driven. Uh, in our case, the expectation as I indicated is to ensure that the sector grows, 
uh, but also that we bring in uh, transformation and inclusivity uh, in regards to bringing in black participants that uh, either two have not necessarily been more involved in the sector. <coughs> you will know that the agricultural sector in its makeup uh, is uh, largely untransformed. And so the idea to transform the sector uh, means that we need to understand the extent to which uh, down the line we see how much uh, black participation is evident. Um, and that requires that uh, the current ownership structures uh, in the agricultural sector are changed. Uh, but also to ensure that where um, we have uh, available uh, land uh, for productive purposes that uh, new entrants are brought into the market. So there are two dynamics to this. The first one is changing the structure in as far as the ownership of uh, agricultural businesses is concerned. The one is introducing new participants that uh, previously had not participated. So as a bank, we find ourselves having to deal with that. In that respect, we do a, an, a segmentation of what we need to, to address starting from uh, new entrants into the market, smallholder farmers, uh, as they call it, uh, small emerging farmers, uh, into the mid-tier mid uh, operation, as well as major and large uh, operations that we, we deal with. Uh, so we, we're looking at both, uh, the, the issue that you raised around land, we're looking at both uh, primary agriculture, uh, which is uh, largely uh, dependent on availability of productive land, mm. And then there's the agro-processing site, uh, which can also happen in urban uh, environments. environments. So you can see the complexities of what Land Bank has to deal with. Uh, on the one side is to ensure that the funding mechanism can support uh, the level of transformation as required. In the next uh, is uh, the ability to transform a sector that on its own is not currently transformed, but which is a complex uh, uh, challenge in relation to changing ownership and then the challenges of land availability right. to, to, to introduce well, uh, emerging farmers. Wh when I speak to Gary a little bit later on, we'll get more into perhaps the commercial farming elements of the bank and how we support on those type of transactions. But before I move from you, Sydney, the, the natural <laughs> follow-up question is then how do you solve the problem, particularly on the emerging uh, farmer side? Because as you just articulated if the bank is funded from raising capital in the capital markets like other banks, then, you know, it's probably likely to be structured more as a commercial banker as opposed to a development funding institution. Uh, surely the simple answer is for government to give you the funds so you can run a DFI of sorts, at least for the segment that you speak of, which are the emerging farmers. Because how else would you fund these farmers who often don't have collateral, may not even have experience in farming, to a large extent, are first-time farmers. How do you do that with commercial money? Yeah, so, so, so the opportunities that we have as a state-owned entity is uh, our existence within the government ecosystem. Uh, so the extent to which we leverage uh, relationships with the uh, Department of uh, Rural Development and Land Reform, uh, the Department of uh, Agriculture, uh, fisheries, uh, for Forestry and Fisheries, uh, as well as other departments that are necessary to ensure that uh, the success of uh, emerging farmers is uh, attained. Mm. What is important uh, to note in this regard is perhaps maybe I should start with uh, the end game to say that in order for emerging farmers to be successful in this space, you need what we have termed a comprehensive support program. Uh, one specific uh, element or program will not necessarily resolve the challenges of, uh, of, of making emerging farmers successful. The point you've raised is that uh, there's an issue of tenure of land. So we need to have uh, comfort around the extent to which uh, an emerging farmer has access to land in a longer period so that uh, that period is able to generate sufficient income to break even. So, so that's the one aspect. The other aspect is the aspect of equity. The point you've raised, emerging farmers do not have uh, wealth in as much as uh, second, third generation farmers would have. 
So as a result, they need equity. And uh, to that extent, this is where the opportunities to leverage the likes of uh, Department of uh, Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries, uh, to leverage some grant funding that can be utilized to beef up a specific uh, transaction with regard to equity that a emerging farmer would not have. Uh, then there's the issue of technical skills. Mm. Because uh, when emerging farmers uh, start, uh, they start because they have the passion to get involved in the business, but they probably do not uh, have the requisite expertise and experience because they haven't operated uh, in that generation of previous farmers. So to that extent, uh, you need some form of an extension service that is provided not only uh, by uh, cooperatives and people that have an interest in the value chain yeah. uh, for that specific farmer, uh, but it is also the likes of DEF who would provide extension services to assist these farmers to be successful. So, so you'll see that, I mean, we're talking equity, we're talking technical uh, yeah. skills, and indeed, the most important part of that is that we must have uh, access to markets. Yes. Uh, and uh, depending on the nature of the business you get involved in, um, and especially, if, for example, if you get involved in cash crops, uh, if you don't have immediate access to markets, uh, you'll have rotten stuff being yes. produced and not being distributed and wasted. So the access to market is also another important aspect. So the point I'm making is that uh, there isn't a single aspect. Indeed, uh, financing, which relates to uh, equity and our ability to afford uh, debt to these customers at an affordable level, uh, is, is, is something that uh, would make this uh, sector successful. Land Bank, as a result, has established a program uh, to subsidize uh, interest uh, for farmers that get into the market. Okay. So instead of uh, advancing facilities at commercial rates, uh, we do our own uh, assessments and calculations, and we realize this debt would have been uh, financed at this specific level of pricing. We then say, but given the need to provide this uh, financing at an accessible uh, or affordable level, uh, we need to subsidize this component. Right. So the support we can get, which we are slowly but surely getting from uh, our ecosystem in government, is to assist us to close that gap uh, relating to equity, but also relating to subsidizing uh, the, uh, the interest uh, so that finance afforded to uh, farmers can be at an affordable price. All right, let me move on to Gary, who's responsible for corporate banking and structured investments at the Land Bank. Gary, this dual mandate, once again, I guess your primary job is on the other side of the dual mandate, and maybe not the one we've spoken about uh, so, so much. But, you know, the one can't survive without the other. And a big part of your job is not just structuring and coming up with the right financing for the bigger transactions. The other part of your job is to also make sure that those linkages and those intermediate relationships actually work so that we have more and more farmers into the value chain. Talk us through some of the activities of your division. So the, the corporate banking and structured investment division is, is effectively structured in a manner that um, provides traditional corporate debt to larger agricultural businesses, um, but also structured investments. And encompassed within structured investments is the bank has over the last 18 months or so embarked on a strategy whereby um, as a principal investor it co-invests alongside uh, uh, black industrialists, BE partners like, uh, uh, like Massimong here um, to to effect meaningful transformation across large agricultural corporates. Um, what, what we found is, is there is a significant willingness amongst, um, um, amongst the agricultural sector in South Africa to, to transform. What there hasn't been hitherto is creative solutions to, to, to enable or effect that, that, that transformation. Um, and and by, by being able to to, to invest equity directly into agricultural businesses, um, but also equally importantly in, in 
in affecting that, that investment, providing financial support and funding mechanisms to, 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 to black owned companies um, to, to come in and buy shares or, 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 or portions of the business alongside us. Um, we, we, we find enormous appetite in terms of commercial farmers to execute those transactions, but also increasingly amongst black investors to participate across, across the, the agricultural value chain. Um, and and w when we invest our capital, what we're, what we're finding is, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to transform at a shareholding level, um, but, but in effect, what we're seeing is, is, th is that transform transformation is actually happening, happening through, through, the, through the business. So it, it's not just about changing the shareholding, it is about ensuring that um, from a transformation and inclusivity perspective, there's sufficient representation um, uh, uh, in respect of black management. Um, that the, the, the employees are, are able to participate through employee trusts or, 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 or share, share structures in, in the profits that are generated by the, by the business and, and, and that they're able to uplift them themselves from the, from the dividends that, that, that flow from these, these very successful, um, well-operated uh, uh, businesses. Well, where, do you think, where do you think, Gary, um, the appetite comes from, you know? Many critics of black economic empowerment will say, oh man, 24 years on, you know, transformation is happening as fast. Um, the white people who have all the assets, and I guess in your industry, it's, it's, it at least optically looks like, you know, it's overwhelmingly white owned. They don't really want to share. They don't really want transformation. You've referenced twice. You've said there's a willingness for the industry to transform. And you've said there's also appetite. Um, for these historically white-owned businesses to want black investors. Where do you think that comes from? Is it something about agriculture? Is it something about farming? So, I, you know, in, in, in my experience, um, it, it's, it's driven predominantly by two, two factors. The one is, 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 a, is a values issue where, where you have large, sophisticated agricultural businesses that are traditionally white-owned, that have come to recognise the the injustices of 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 the past and and the effect that apartheid has, has ha had on 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 our country and on our, our economy, and and are looking to actively partner with uh, uh, black investors who share the same values that they have, um, and 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 grow and expand their business. Now, clearly that goes hand in hand with the with the commercial element of it. Um, in that commercial farmers have also recognized that black investors bring a very different skill set to, to, to the business. Um, and, and that's very clearly demonstrated by, by, by the partnership that, that Massimong and Maton Citrus um, have, have formed over the last year or so. Um, and, and, and the black investors we're talking about are sophisticated investors in their own right. They're corporately savvy. Um, and and they, they, they bring a, an enormous and a significant strategic thinking um, that you know, corporate farming organizations ha perhaps haven't had in, in, in the past. And, and in, in, in the transactions that we've executed over the last 18 months or so, um, We've seen the synergistic benefits of, of, of that uh, uh, work enormously uh, uh, in favor of both the, 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 the commercial farmer and the black investor who's coming into the business. So Gary has been referencing the story of Massimong for a while now. Althea is here. She's the chief executive of Massimong Group Holdings. What has been the journey of Massimong, particularly in this particular industry? Thanks, Andili. So the journey for Massimong in the agricultural space has been... I say trying and interesting as well in the beginning we've concluded one transaction and we are quite bullish on the sector and we are looking at a few transactions as well we've identified the agricultural sector as a key sector within our investment holding company and to date we have as i said concluded a significant 
acquisition or meaningful stake Is this in Mouton Citrus. Tell yes. me the history of the deal. How do you even come about doing the transaction? So f effectively, our relationship with Land Bank and, you know, I think in terms of, you know, the history, um, Land Bank introduced us to, to the deal. Um, there was obviously one of the shareholders were looking to exit and, you know, Land Bank was instrumental in providing Massimong with an innov innovative solution in terms of a combination of debt and equity funding. So they assisted Massimong in terms of providing a certain level of debt funding, which they were comfortable with that the business could service from the cash flows within Maton. And the balance, obviously, Massimong would need, needed to raise in the form of equity. And as Gary rightly said, you know, they are investors in Maton as well. So they assisted Massimong in partnering with us as an investor and assisting us in, you know, basically reducing the amount of equity capital that we right. would then have to right. raise. Yes. So, so tell us about the business. What attracted you to Mouton Citrus when indeed they brought the transaction to you? What made Massimong go, that's the one. We're going to put our skills, effort, balance sheet, all sorts of securities. I'm pretty sure Gary is not a... It doesn't look like he's a nice guy, but he's not that nice. Mm. He's going to look for security, I'm sure. Yes, so Mouton Citrus is a producer, uh, packaging as well as exporter of citrus. It's one of the biggest citrus producers within the country. And as I said, it was, you know, the exposure to export um, earnings was attractive for Massimong. And from that perspective, we thought that, you know, Mouton because we were aligned as well from a strategic perspective in terms of our partners who have a very strong history of you know, success in, in the citrus industry. And we thought that that would be a flagship investment for Massimong. And you know, we could then build from there. So Mouton being a top tier, um, basically the fact that we were invested in the full value chain and not only in, in the farms, and also partnering with good, strong um, operators such as the Mouton family. And Gary, I could be sitting at home watching this and I'm thinking, I've got a deal. You know, I, I know a company, I've spoken to the owners. There's something to be done. Um, I want to, I too, like Althea and her partners at, at uh, Massimong, I too want to make a, a move for this transaction. Where do I start and what are the key things that your division at the Lambeck, who does this kind of stuff, would be looking for from me as that potential acquire role? or part acquirer of that business? And Didi, the first thing is, is you know, we, we, we're not a marriage broker. We, we, we don't put businesses, black and white businesses together. We, we finance businesses. Um, and and that, that being said, um, where, where the, 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 the commercial farmer and a black investor are, 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 are willing to do business together, um, we, we look for a couple of, couple of specific, specific things. The, the first one is, is, is the viability of the existing business. You know, ultimately, we invest for predominantly th three things. We, we want to see agricultural economic growth. We want meaningful transformation and inclusivity at a shareholding level, but also operationally. Um, and, and, and thirdly, we, we look for sustainable employment and job job creation so so those are the, th the 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 three core things that that we look at in respect of any investment opportunity that we're we're going to going to going to finance you didn't mention securities does that mean it's not an issue so security is 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 part of it um but you know one of the things i think that that we've achieved reasonably successfully um is, is the fact that you know, w when we finance BE companies investing into these white agricultural businesses, security, sure, that's, that's a component of it. You know, we're a bank and at the end of the day, we, we need to be certain that, that we will we'll get our money back in terms of who we're lending it to. But, but where we're a little bit different is, is we, we have moved from being a security only institution to to a bank that is prepared to look at the cash flows stemming from these businesses. And in the case of Maton Citrus, you know, it's a multi-generational farm. It's one of the more 
in, in, in our opinion, one of the more successful, well-run, professional citruses businesses in South Africa with a long-established track record of operational performance and excellence. Yes. And off the, off the back of that performance, we were able to take a view on the fact that if, if, if Massimong invested into this business and we lent them money to do that, yes that the business itself would generate enough revenues and free cash flows to ultimately repay any debt that we had in the, in the business. So that's, that I think is the fundamental change that, that we've affected over the last year or two within the, within the land bank. Just to add on to Gary's point, so effectively, you know, the reason why, well, one of the reasons why, you know, this opportunity was attractive for Masimong, um, besides being bullish on the sector, uh, along with mining, as I said, and financial services, you know, from a debt capacity, we were comfortable to take a certain level of gearing against you know, potential cash flows without putting too much pressure on distributing those cash flows outside, out of, Mas of Mouton, because obviously Mouton, as a shareholder in Mouton, we'd also have to think about future expansion and all of that. So it was about getting that combination of equity versus debt, um, the gearing effectively correct and not over gearing ourselves as Massimong as well as the business or the cash flows within okay. the entity that we invest so, in. So you're currently on 35% of the business as I understand. What are your plans for the future then? So effectively we are on 18%, but 18, we do okay. have an option to acquire up to 35% oh, effectively. Okay. So yes, I guess sir. the plan is to get to 35%. Yes, yes. <laughs> so Land Bank has obviously partnered with us from an right. equity perspective. So okay. yeah, we've then have an option to acquire. To okay, sounds good. Percent. Sounds really, really good. Let's move on. Steve Baggy is my next guest. Um, he's also an operator and a client, an operator rather of an agricultural business and a client of the Land Bank. Steve, share with us your story. I know that you're quite active in, the, in AFASA, which is uh, the association um, for black uh, operators in the industry. I've, I've attended a few of your own conferences. It's, it's wonderful to see, especially when everyone is in one room, there's a real cohort of black farmers that are out there uh, doing it on their own as operators, perhaps slightly different to just investors. But give us a sense of your own journey in your business and uh, how you ended up working with Land Bank. Thank you, Andile. It's, a, it's an emotional story to tell. In I've got my tissues. Don't you worry, Steve. Okay. <laughs> okay. In, in the sense that he, when you are to introduce yourself as an emerging uh, African farmer, uh, you definitely must put you know, the context of the journey. We, we got on the farms. I'm saying on the farms. I'm representing the many people who are not here. With a, a literally a five-year expectation from government that here's a farm, make it work, farm. Stay there, focus on the farm. Don't do any other thing outside this confinement. Now, you don't have a living wage or salary. You, you've got university kids to cater for. You've got medical bills. You've got the inherited workforce to deal with. You've got redundant infrastructure, 35, 38, 38 year, 40 year old rotten infrastructure, which ought to have been recapitalized prior to you getting on the farm. Now I'm saying at an operational sense as an operations person. You sound like an operation. Yes. This is the reality yeah. you find on the farm. Right. What Steve did. Steve talked to government. Government, you promised me recap. I'm on the farm. I've got my little kit of the little millions I came yeah. with. But it's more or less two years now. You deal with rental. You deal with the canal water services. You deal with the staff, you deal with the breakages of this dilapidated infrastructure. Yes, you deal with environmental catastrophes. You become a social worker. You are everything as a farm. Now you rely on that little kit that you came with. It's finished within a year or two years. Now here you are, you've got nowhere to turn to. This is the story of an emerging African farm. 
you go to commercial bank, they say the rules of FICA applies. You come to land bank, land bank look at all the policy related issues we have just discussed, the equity, the doability, the technical capacity, your contract on the farm, and your own, what is it, credit, what do you call that thing, ITC. Yeah. And they look at you as well on your credit worthiness. And, and they look at the markets. Now this is the regime of the totality of all these things that are so nice. They are bank rules, compliance, these are nuances of the game. But here you are, an emerging farmer. You don't have all these, um, some of these things. Now coming to Steve. Steve, luckily, because he come from all this fancy background. What fancy background is it? Okay. Steve, Steve, Steve has an honors degree from Liverpool University as a, a rural development manager. He is a development and regional manager, planner from South Devon University. And he's an operations person trained by Cranfield at a postgraduate diploma in South Africa. Now you come with this realm of your farming as well as your skills expose, you know what to do in getting things right here. And you come up with your three-year growth plan. And in my growth plan, I said, let me make do with what there is a potential for on this farm. This farm has been an ostrich farm. Wait, where is the farm, Steve? The farm is situated about 30 kilometers from Cook House. Okay. And it's about... Uh, 125 kilometers from Port Elizabeth. It's a long N10, not that far from the tar road. Now, now I said to myself, ostrich is a no-no, which was the previous thing. Remember, I got on this farm whilst the farm has been lying fallow for five years. Literally vandalized, nothing taking place here. Just like. You know? And that's endemic of all government farms that many of my generation get to occupy. These are farms, some of which uh, gets procured five or ten years. Some of them had a caretaker arrangement. Others, there would be some kind of arrangement in place. But the reality is that when we get on these farms, they are vandalized. There's a dilapidated material, all sorts of ills. But, but now, getting back to Steve's Back journey. to Steve, yes. yes. I like the way you speak yes. to yourself in the third person. But yes. yes. S so what does Steve do now? Now Steve put up a very smart three-year development growth plan for the farm. The first priority is to stabilize whatever operational activity and potential that existed here. What are the items you need to look into? I package them. And then the second one is to look at that which relatively stabilized. What kind of resource plan do you have? to move the farm from that yield to the targeted yield in terms of forecast and in terms of revenue. This is where Steve is. Steve hasn't arrived at the third At the third year. Uh, target yet. Okay. Now, 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 Steve, in the middle of the second year, fortunately, Land Bank turns the other E at this time. Listen to Steve. <laughs> Be because Steve has done that stabilization. I How see. Steve did that stabilization? The little man is still managed to scrap from government, got to be open about this, provincial government, and uh, from other sources. Steve utilized an approach that says build on your asset base. So I relatively bought new things with receipts, invoices here, yeah, in that year. With my lot more of that little money that I came with, all the assets that are anchored around the farm potential. Remember, it was ostrich. Mm. There's a lot of lucerne here. It so what is Steve farming at this stage? Steve is doing the lucerne production at the moment. Oh. It's a 35. This is 15-year-old, 13 to 15-year-old lucerne. Any of the persons in here will tell you that's third grade in lucerne production terms. So Steve said, okay, let's stress on this, on stress on this potential and move this lucerne relatively to 89 hectare focus. Now, in the crop studies we did, it was told to us anything from 18 to 20, you will break even in lucent production. Now, you can imagine coming to Land Bank and Land Bank listening to me. I'm stretching a farm from 39, old lucent, to the new additional 40% of 
of assistance I get from land bank capital investment on the farm. This is putting up new pivots, uh, optimizing the irrigation system, and on electricity as well. Because when I inherited the farm, there's a lot of electricity wasted on the farm. Now I'm using land bank's money to optimize even on that electricity so that I utilize the net electricity that's required to drive the production targets I'm looking for on the farm. This is the second path now, Steve, that is with land bank producing on the farm, stretching that lucent from the 39 old, adding the 40 relatively to 80 tons in two years' time. Steve will be in a millions bracket business and no more on a shoestring budget. <laughs> and, uh, that Steve is it. Previously, in that first year to second year. Right. Premised on subsistence income of not knowing what tomorrow will be. Right. And pray for the next month as if God will do this miracle. Right. He does it. But Steve, I have to pause and ask Steve a question. I like this third person thing. <laughs> what makes Steve persevere? What, 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 what makes Steve persevere from those days um, as you rightfully painted the picture when you first took over the farm with the people you came on with, um, you know, no, no lack of consistent income, children in university, but you really want to take on this opportunity, particularly Steve with really impressive qualifications. Steve could quite easily go and get a job somewhere and pay for his kids' school education. Why, why, why persevere? What's, what's the driver? I think it's a, it's a sense of hope on land bank in particular. I mean, I've, I've, I've dealt with Land Bank. The CEO was here some time back. Kamiya? Was it Kamiya? Yes, I've dealt with the CEO. Land Bank has got all the nice policies, mind you. Very nice policies. Policies that complement government, national development plan in the country. But what's lacking is the institutional capacity that must talk to the development plan priorities on how to radically complement the requirement of an emerging farmer and customize that to the required indicators that best lift our economy locally. Those are the ingredients that are not yet there. I, I will talk to a length of plenty of the issues on how Land Bank can turn this BE vehicle to best serve the commercialization of an emerging farmer and put up a clear maturity path with clearly graded systems and that's the industry sector complement. And we drive this thing with associations and us as chairperson of land reforms in the district. We can make our country work and grow the agriculture, utilizing most of this potential that lies mm. with these emerging farmers. So, so I asked um, Sydney a little bit earlier on about the issue of criticisms that could easily be thrown around the land bank. You, by clearly working hard and when the one ear wasn't listening, you made sure that you come back with your own stabilization plan and your own future plans. Mm -hmm. So it's easy for, certainly for me to start seeing the reasons why perhaps a land bank started listening. What key tenants or key takeouts or lessons that you learned in that journey that maybe you can impart on other emerging farmers as and when they go and seek such support? Because you know, generally the view is, oh, I don't get any help. You know, I try and nobody really listens to me or no one comes back to me and, and all sorts of, uh, of, of, of criticisms that come up. And I'm pretty sure some of them, as you've rightfully said, may very well be warranted. But there are people like you who have succeeded in this mm. stuff. How did you do it? And how can yes. the rest of us do it? Definitely there is that talk at the moment. More so I'm one of the leaders at District 11. But I, 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 I tell them a simple logic. Go and work at that which Land Bank points to. Don't come and do the hostile mark time approach that this is a, you know, a fatalistic attitude. It's not going to work. They are not listening to me. Pick it up. Look at the alternative ways on how best to lift yourself to that level of requirement that could best make your case be responsive to what they want, which is exactly what I did. I mean, go to government. Go to area, to the district, and even the provincial office and put up your correspondence and say, this is where I am. You are also part of the stakeholders who are the closest pillars to me. Let's get on this thing. Let's make it work. Right. And, and in my case, that's the combination of all other forces close by to me. I could cry out loud to, which I utilize. And they managed, together with my plans, to swing the ball back to Land Bank. And Land Bank look at its thing and look at all his requirements. I mean, I had within that space 
to pressurize the department to give me the 30-year lease, which wasn't there prior. Yeah. And they look at the plans that I'm having and all the work that I would have done and the correspondence I'm having. Now it's a matter of our consensual agency. I see, Steve. And no longer a Steve's issue. Sa same question to, to Sydney and Gary. Um, how can we get more out of you? I mean, you must sit on the other side as well and just wish that you could share with us certain information, all right? Because you know how things work. Uh, you know where you're strong. You know where your challenges may be. Um, give us some tips from the inside. How can we get more out of you? Yeah, so, so Andy, when we started, I said we, we need to look at this from a comprehensive support program. And the point that uh, Steve is making around institutional capacity is institutional capacity across the value chain, across the board. Uh, so let's use his example. Uh, the issue of access to land and the knowledge that you've got uh, security of tenure in that uh, land is important. In the first instance, he had five years. Five years is not good enough uh, to turn a business around, particularly in the state in which he found it. There's an issue of recapitalization of land that was previously owned by government. Uh, to expect an emerging farmer to put his own capital into correcting what was already dilapidated uh, is an issue that requires address. Uh, and so as you can see from all of these, uh, there are a variety of institutions that needs to be coordinated uh, to deal with this particular aspect. From our side, uh, in terms of uh, the funding model of the bank, we are grappling with that as an institution having conversations amongst ourselves with the shareholder uh, who is National Treasury uh, around how best we need to model the funding for the land bank. Because as it, as it is currently, it's, a, it's commercially, largely commercially funded. Very minimal uh, support structures from a grant point of view. Sure. And uh, if you are to redress issues that Steve has spoken about, you will not be able to do that with capital that requires returns. Uh, and so to that respect, I think uh, if we can get some support, it's support from uh, institutions uh, and representations that uh, the likes of Steve have, uh, yourselves and industry in general, uh, to talk about how land bank should be uh, improved in its funding model to particularly address that aspect. The president, for example, uh, in, in recent times, uh, made a comment uh, in parliament that uh, there's probably a need for a state-owned bank. Uh, we, from our side, think that there's also a need for existing state-owned enterprises like land bank, post office, the post bank, and so on, IDC and the like, uh, a, a proper reflection of what for each specific sector is required in order to leverage sufficiently the capabilities that that institution can deliver. In our space, we think that Land Bank is ripe now for that review uh, to the extent to which uh, it can be supported uh, in order to be able to address the aspects that still are Ripe for about. review. Gary, you want to throw in some more? Yeah, um, and Dili, I, 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 I think Sydney, Sydney's right. Um, in the short term, though, because some, some of the, th the reforms we're looking are, are, are going, to, going to take time, and particularly from an emerging farmer perspective, uh, <coughs> excuse me, you look at, 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 at Steve's case, uh, uh, for, for example, um, you know, the first thing is, 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 is a passion and, 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 and perseverance and, and persistence. Um, I, I, I suspect Steve would not be where he is today if, if he hadn't been as driven as he was to, to succeed. Um, I, I, th I think he's also right in the sense, though, that, that solving the, the emerging farmer quandrum, uh, for want of a, a, a better word, is, is, is it needs a multi-pronged approach. You know, Land Bank definitely has a role to play, um, but, but Steve was very proactive in terms of talking to national government, provincial government, local government, and ensuring that, that he got support to the extent 
that Land Bank was then able to provide the funding support. So things like a, 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 a tenure, um, recapitalization of the of the of the existing farm to improve the asset base and and and, and soil quality. Um, bringing all of those things together is 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 an intricate and 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 time consuming effort. Uh, and and to be frank, you know. We, we as land bank and government agencies are probably not as effective at, at, at facilitating that as we, as we should be, but it, it needs an integrated approach to, to solve it. Okay, all right, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna pause there on the stage and I'm gonna allow our live studio audience uh, to throw in and weigh in. Perhaps we'll take three questions from the floor, which uh, you can throw to any of the panelists. You can be specific about who you'd like to respond to the question or you can just throw it in there and I'll uh, take the responsibility to allocate it before we wrap up our nation in conversation. Um, yes, sir, we've got one hand, we've got two hands, we've got three hands. Please tell me your name, where you're from, and what your question is. Uh, good morning, thank you very much. Um, I'm Jack Armour from Free State Aid League. How does Land Bank be begin funding? I think... Um, you, start, you asked a question as to, you know, new farmer who's got no um, capital, who's got no experience, and he wants to start out. Um, you don't want to give him a million. You know, you want to start off with gradual amounts. But at what level does Land Bank start funding? You know, does one start at CEDA first or some other organization before you get to Land Bank, just to build up that experience and credibility and cash flow that you need? Um, and then the second question is, um, no one's mentioned the role of commercial farmers and um, production partnerships and the role of a commercial farmer in, in giving that support to the, the land bank emerging farmer just to help him get, 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 get his feet on the ground and to give that kind of mentorship support. But often it's, it's a production partnership sort of gives a, an incentive to the commercial farmer as well because he's got a stake in it. He's put in some money, he's put in some capital, he's got a share in the profit and the better this farmer, the emerging farmer does, the better he'll also do in his share. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Please pass the microphone. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Keith Middleton, also an emerging farmer, also part of a FASA. And my question is simple to Land Bank. I mean, it's not the first time we're hearing about the, the so-called uh, 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 um, method of funding that they have. I mean, it's years coming in the making. And we're still sitting with Land Bank grappling with how they're going to fund it's actually uh, quite disturbing from where I come from, where I sit. I think it's, a, it's about time we got together as a sector and thrashed out these issues because clearly it's a multifaceted approach that we need to, to have with all stakeholder involvement. And, uh, you know, as Andile said, uh, uh, sorry, as uh, the gentleman, Sydney, mentioned about uh, where we come from as, Steve, sorry, Steve mentioned, where we come from as emerging farmers, it's totally, totally wrong, if I may just use that word, because we on the back foot already been black farmers, and then to be still dogged with all these funding challenges and all the other uh, 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 getting farms that are bankrupt before you start, so it, it's really we really need to think differently, change our approach of how we're going to take this thing. Now with the issue of land expropriation without compensation, that's hot on, in every news bulletin, if I may say. <laughs> it's time that we really start now coming together All right. and start putting our heads together and finding solutions that are going to work and that are going to have inclusive growth. Thank you. I got you, Keith. Please pass the microphone, gentlemen, just behind you. Hi, it's Elaine from the Land Bank. I just wanted to get um, more feedback from, from both Althea and Steve. Althea, um, Massimong's investment, how is that translated into um, greater empowerment for more black people? Maybe you can just expand on what Massimong's doing in that regard. And then uh, to Steve, you've got a great story. Thank you for sharing. Uh, I just wanted to check what's, what's, what's next for Steve? What's next for you? I like the way you asked that. What's next for Steve? Because you're still talking to him in the third person. He's some other guy. He's not the guy in front of us. Thank you so much for those questions. 
really hot questions, and we're going to try to get through them as quick as we can. We only have a limited amount of time. Jack is asking, one, at what level do you start funding? Do I need to go to other small financiers before I come to the land bank? What's the number? I think that's relatively quick. And tell us more about the partnerships where you are pairing established farmers with emerging farmers. Maybe that's a good question for any of you guys. Yeah, per perhaps let me start off. Uh, the <laughs> our, our approach is commercial farming. So as soon as uh, a business case has uh, commerciality, we start there. There isn't a specific amount that will say, no, we don't fund below a million, for example. Because in some instances, you find that an operation already is in existence, and its requirements may well be only 300,000 or 500,000 to beef up what already exists. Okay. In some instances, it's uh, initiating the business up from scratch. Uh, so there isn't anything that says this is the minimum, but uh, the commerciality of the operation is what determines okay. it. Uh, and in as far as uh, involvement of uh, uh, commercial uh, business, existing commercial business is, is concerned, we have examples of those transactions, similar transactions where we have had a commercial farmer that uh, gets involved with uh, a, an emerging farmer or in some instances, in fact, even with uh, farm workers to establish a business and support it in the form of technical support, insurance, capital, as well as access to market. I'll give you an example of a farmer we funded uh, out uh, in Limpopo in the dairy business uh, where they had the opportunity to extend the business in acquiring a new land and they've set up as an, an SPV between this commercial farmer, white commercial farmer, his staff members, into an entity that purchased the extension of the land. So the profitability that is made with uh, the new uh, production is shared between the farmer and, uh, and the farm workers. So we've got examples of that, but I think the basic fundamental that Jack is trying to make is that uh, industry, uh, the agricultural sector in general, cannot succeed if we operate still on the basis of uh, exclu exclusivity. Right. So the extent to which commercial farming operations uh, take in uh, partnerships uh, with uh, emerging farmers uh, will uh, uh, give an indication of the extent to which we can improve uh, transformation in the sector.